So he meets an alien civilization that could solve all of our technological problems, only the smug jokes refuse to give it to us because they are afraid it could hurt our cultural development. So today is this channel's 100th episode, and the topic seemed appropriate for the milestone or milestones since this week is also the third anniversary of the original episode on Megastructures. Now the reason a weekly show is celebrating episode 100 on its third anniversary rather than episode 156 is that early on the show was not weekly, and indeed it was about four months before the second episode came out discussing the implications of those megastructures in terms of the Fermi Paradox, the question of where all the aliens are. This channel was built with three basic focuses in mind, megastructures built by high-tech civilizations, speculating about high-tech civilizations, and challenging the assumptions we receive from science fiction and life, the universe, and everything. So celebrating our 100th episode and 3rd anniversary by returning to the Alien Civilization series seemed appropriate. Fundamentally, this series is an extension of our discussion of the Fermi Paradox, but focuses more on the motives of hypothetical aliens and trying to see if they make sense. It is debatable if the Fermi Paradox should be called a paradox since we still know so little about the Universe to be calling aspects of it contradictory but it tends to seem that way since so many of the suggested solutions only make sense by discarding some assumption about life or the Universe that seems solidly rooted in common sense. If we accept intelligent life is incredibly rare, it feels like a modernized form of geocentrism, viewing ourselves as somehow special. If we assume we are not, we have to figure out why the Universe isn't flooded in alien civilizations, or is but we can't see them. Since we know we, by our modern view of things, would absolutely go around exploring and colonizing the Universe and saying hello to every alien we met, we need some reason this isn't happening, essentially why modern humanity's priorities and outlook would not be a representative sample of intelligent life in this Universe. And we've gone through tons of suggested solutions, from all life dying off from technological apocalypses to them hiding out, or maybe being unable to travel the stars, or simply not wanting to. None of those offer us the universe we saw in film and television like Star Wars or Star Trek, with tons of aliens and easy interstellar travel, the classic space opera universe many of us, myself included, would love to be true. Today we'll examine the Zoo Hypothesis, often regarded as a good Fermi Paradox solution. One example of it is the well-known Star Trek Prime Directive. I'll paraphrase it as not interfering in other civilizations, especially those who are still technologically limited to their own original planet. In Star Trek, there's a line between civilizations with warp travel and without. For those who have it, have interstellar travel, you can contact them openly, presumably on the grounds they either already know of alien civilizations or will soon find out, no contact before that. Now before we continue, I should add that it is really the zoo hypothesis we are looking at today, and that extends beyond the example of the Prime Directive, but we will give that a little extra focus today as it is more familiar ground. So we want to ask ourselves why someone might choose not to interfere in lower tech civilizations, or even wall them up in the equivalent of a galactic zoo. What's their definition of non-interference? When and for what do they make exceptions, if any, and how far will they go to enforce the policy? The key aspect of non-interference policies, in regard to the Fermi Paradox, always comes down to enforcement. You are a starship captain observing a planet full of primitives, you aren't interfering in their civilization, and fair enough, I don't consider non-interference always a preferred option but it's decently ethically sound as a basic principle, keep your nose out of other people's business. We often do this when observing animals in the wild or reporting on news, minimal interference, and we have a variety of motives for such policies. It depends a lot on what your basic motivations are for doing it, 
and a lot of the time, in Star Trek, it doesn't seem to be the best interests of the civilization not being interfered with, since they will stick to that policy even when the alternative is that civilization being destroyed. A friend of mine often referred to those episodes as Smug Trek, since they seem too confident and superior in their non-interference even when there seems no way to argue it benefits the native species, and they always get rescued from the consequences by some plot contrivance, hence part of the reason for the episode title, Smug Aliens. The other half of that being alien civilizations in fiction who tend to qualify as Space Elves, the loose nickname for when a writer creates a race that is supposed to be ancient, wise, and enlightened but comes off more like smugly superior jokes, frequently for refusing to help directly or through sharing technology in dealing with some horrible galactic menace because they have some sort of non-interference policy, one that for some reason always seems to mysteriously exempt giving lectures about how the primitive Earthlings should behave. And yet, the test of any given guideline or rule is how it functions in extremities and strange cases. You are sitting there observing this species in their Stone Age, and know that you can't talk to them, by your own rules, for several thousand years to come. That's the first problem, how realistic is it that you can avoid contact that long while monitoring them? Can you really expect to go centuries with dozens of folks working on such a project without one of them messing up, or even doing it on purpose? It is, after all, pretty hard to watch a civilization or rather a group of civilizations, regularly get smashed up by disasters, plagues, starvation, or belligerent neighbors and not do anything when you could. These aren't strangers either, you are getting to know them even if they don't know you, and if you know that over all that time someone is likely to break the rule, is there much point to even trying to observe it? Someone is bound to ask what the real point is. I mean, do the aliens below really need to learn the hard way that plagues are bad and that hygiene is good? You might say that without those they'd never develop medicine, but who says they need to? I have never invented a vaccine or suffered from a plague, and I don't particularly care if the guys researching new vaccines learned the trade from guys who did or aliens who cured all theirs a million years ago. Civilizations do not invent technology, individuals or groups do. Yet we still assume the rest of the civilization ought to be able to benefit from that. We don't expect every person to learn microbiology before taking antibiotics. And yet most of us do tend to either think non-interference is a good general policy, or if not, we respect the basic concept. In general, leave those folks be to find their own way is a philosophy we can respect. Where it goes a bit overboard is in the specifics. You are monitoring some civilization and detect a giant asteroid en route to hit the planet. Do you take any action? If yes or no, what's the threshold? Is it okay to knock aside one that would sterilize the entire planet but not one that would just kill most people? If so, why? If yes to both, what about one that would just hit one city and keep the damage pretty localized, like one about to fall on New York City or Ancient Rome? And if yes to all of the above, why not help with a plague? And what about the difference between one that will kill a few people and one with a genuine 100% mortality rate and airborne to boot? On top of that, does it matter what those aliens want? I mean I would happily accept a cure to cancer from aliens, and if they said, Isaac, we'd love to give this to you but we are worried about the cultural damage our involvement will cause, my reply would simply be, let us worry about that, it's not your concern. But there is obviously a line on that, too. I'd be happy to have their technology, but I don't want their opinions on how we should run our economies, which type of government we should use, or what sort of things we should or should not outlaw. At the same time, I can hardly tell them they can't have opinions on such things and share them when asked, and we all know that whether or not their opinion on something really is more enlightened, tons of folks will view it that way and use Ah, but that's how they do it, and they are older and wiser, as their argument. So it's not a clear-cut issue, but let's go back to our asteroid case. We will say it is a planet killer. When it hits, it's going to sterilize the planet. The captain calls his officers together and asks them what to do. The EXO says, no way, the policy is clear. We do nothing. It's sad, but rules are rules, and if we break it on this, what next? 
Maybe we go cure their diseases and teach them to make fusion reactors and fusion bombs too? For all we know, they might turn out to be the next species of genocidal lunatics that will sterilize other people's planets. The engineer says maybe that's exactly what they should do. This policy is monstrous, and that reasoning is no better than not helping a kid out of a burning house on the theory they might grow up to be a serial killer. These guys have maxed out their brains from an evolutionary standpoint, same as a Stone Age child adopted through a time machine to 24th century Earth could learn the technology as well as a child of that era could. Why not just give it to them now, and give them the benefit of our wisdom about what to do or not to do? Blow up that asteroid, land, introduce ourselves, and share our knowledge. The XO is aghast at this, of course, and the captain doesn't approve either. So the science officer says, look, we don't have to go all the way on this, we just blow up that asteroid. This policy is meant to protect them from us, and an extinct civilization doesn't need protection. If something truly threatening comes up again, we'll decide at that time what to do. Now, in your typical TV show, looking to avoid morally ambiguous plot resolutions, this would be where the science officer says, Captain, while I was calculating the minimum deflection the asteroid needs, I realized that the gravity of our own ship had perturbed the asteroid, and if we weren't here, it wouldn't hit them. Or maybe, Captain, this asteroid isn't natural. This is actually an artificial asteroid clearly sent by the bad guys to look natural, and the Captain can confidently order the asteroid dealt with and everyone is happy and forgets about the unresolved issues they just had. If that doesn't happen, we might see the Captain reluctantly agree to destroy it, and the science officer go to punch in the coordinates to blow it up, only to have the EXO pull out a pistol and tell the Captain they were leaving them of duty, or even shoot the science officer and the Captain. Then a three-way fight breaks out, ending with the Chief Engineer sabotaging the ship to crash into the asteroid and fleeing before the impact with the surviving crew members in the Interventionist camp. That's the problem with sincerely held beliefs on issues involving life and death, people tend to feel okay about killing for them, and I can't really call the EXO or Engineer wrong for doing what they did. Of course the Engineer and the other Interventionists now need to decide what to do when they land, and they need to consider what the response is going to be from back home when they get the news in a few centuries. Back at Central Command, when they do get the news, they have a few options. Of course option one is they might not care, policies do tend to change over centuries, which is another issue with that mission to begin with. Still on option one, they might still have that policy but have had so many people break it in the centuries since they enacted it that they've pretty much given up on enforcement. Now as to enforcement, what should they do? Go there and arrest the interventionists? I might do it as a high-tech civilization so the original folks might still be alive later when a new fleet arrives, but what about their descendants? Regardless of whether the originals are still around, can you arrest their descendants? Can you forcibly deport them? No other punishments just remove them. If they resist, can you kill them? What about the original civilization? Do you take their technology away? Or repeat what the asteroid would have done and nuke the place from orbit? Not many people would be okay with the latter, I hope, but that's the only one that really has teeth as a deterrent. If you believe letting that civilization die from an asteroid strike is wrong, odds are you will take action regardless of whether or not it means a prison term or even death, so your only deterrent is knowing it would be all for nothing, that the Armada is going to come by and torch the place and reverse what you did. And of course if the interventionists think that is a possibility, they might still do it, and gamble on the chance that in the centuries they have before Ward gets home and a fleet arrives, they can bootstrap the local civilization up to the point they have a chance to resist. Indeed, considering the alternatives to not working fast enough, they have an excuse to outright play gods to establish and maintain enough control over the local population to get everyone working on increasing their numbers and accepting the new technology and turning over every bright kid to them for science and engineering educations. One might even argue it is better to play false gods to save a civilization than let it be wiped out. They can even rationalize that they are going to turn themselves over after the crisis for judgment content to pay for that deception with their lives if that's what it takes. What we don't see in Star Trek or fiction following a similar code is the Enterprise firing on some ship that is headed for a primitive planet with the intent to give them technology. K-9 
Considering what we know of that universe, anyone sufficiently determined can get their hands on or build their own warp-capable ship, and I assume they don't classify their discoveries of new civilizations. So someone back on Earth who disagrees with the Prime Directive can go replicate or requisition parts for a spacecraft. What would they do to a group of folks who were building a ship and flat out said they plan to fly to the nearest discovered planet with primitives and say hello and tell the aliens how to build stuff? Do they arrest them? Confiscate the ship? Quite possibly. What if they don't say what the ship is for? Do you warn them off and shoot them down while approaching the planet? Do they keep a fleet around each such planet for such occasions? What about aliens not in the Federation? Do they shoot down an alien research team from a species that doesn't follow the Prime Directive? This is why it doesn't work for the Fermi Paradox, because we cannot expect every civilization to follow such a principle, and we can't expect all their members to either, and it's hard to imagine how you would enforce it over thousands or even millions of years. Is there some graveyard of ships floating around our solar system? Where aliens tried to run the blockade to help or exploit us and got shot down? Probably not. Let's assume there was though, and that normally when you get interstellar capable they come in and say hi. When and how should they do it? Most of us would say that specific technology is a trifle arbitrary, a simple nod to pragmatism rather than assuming it implies the civilization is somehow more immune to cultural contamination by having it. We often see in fiction the enlightened race showing up to talk to a civilization about our technology level, and usually quietly. This brings up the issue of whether or not it's okay to introduce yourselves a bit early if you know they might be about to kill themselves off in the next 20 years, but will almost certainly make it to interstellar travel in the next 10 to 30 years, and you can have the same argument as before. The XO says no, the science officer suggests sneaking them some vital piece of tech by email, a design for cheap and easy solar panels and batteries for instance, and the engineer just says screw it, call them up and introduce yourselves and offer them the technology one generation early. In a case like this, the captain might be more inclined to go with a direct and open intervention route, or at least try a secret introduction to their leaders. Of course we don't know how aliens will view interacting with other civilizations. The flaw of the Zoo Hypothesis and Prime Directive from a Fermi Paradox standpoint comes from it being very hard to see all of them sharing the same view, or anyone being willing or able to enforce it on those who did not. After all, we do have professional policies about how zoologists or news reporters are supposed to act when in the field not interfering, just observing, but it's not like that's actually enforced. So it would seem a Fermi Paradox solution that can't be valid because it's unlikely to be practical to enforce it. However, the basic notion of the Zoo Hypothesis is actually a little more subtle, because what folks often miss is that the Fermi Paradox assumes we are looking up at the actual Universe and seeing it empty when it is not. Unless by some freak coincidence, all high-tech alien machinery and empires are conveniently invisible, which would be rather weird, you don't make a zoo for primitives by limiting your own civilization, you do it by creating a fake environment around them. When we build a zoo near a city, we don't deconstruct our skyscrapers, we create a habitat that conceals those aspects of our civilization that we need to for their well-being. So if you are making a zoo out of Earth, you don't go deconstructing your own Dyson spheres, you make a big one around Earth or a whole solar system that creates an illusion. That is an immense project, but way easier than limiting what you do in the rest of the galaxy. And it doesn't need to be solar system sized either. I mean it probably isn't that hard to snatch up unmanned probes and fake the data coming back, or even manned missions and trick the crews, but that fake zoo universe doesn't necessarily even need to resemble the real one. Easier to protect that zoo too, it's small and cut off, so you don't have to worry about somebody sending a rogue hello signal into the zoo. However, that maybe doesn't go far enough. We often discuss advanced aliens as being a sort of higher entity, 
and in the softer kinds of science fiction, this is usually some being of pure energy, evolved to a higher plane of existence or such, but we often just assume they aren't organic anymore instead. We'll talk more about artificial intelligence in a couple weeks, but for the moment, imagine some civilization that had gone digital. They all live in this universe, or their universe rather, but essentially inside computers. They will consider that sort of existence just as good as a biological one, probably a lot more preferable since it is likely to be vastly more efficient in terms of resources and energy to support one individual thinking entity. That means there is a decent chance they converted their home planet into one big computer and just took copies of all the DNA then uploaded all their animals into it too. Not just digital people, but digital cats and dogs and even honeybees. They could always grow or print up a new organic body for themselves or those critters if they needed to from digital DNA archives. So from their perspective, what is the best way to make sure a primitive civilization is protected? There's a good chance the answer they come up with was to upload them just send in some covert missile carrying self-replicating machines to land somewhere on the planet, then do some self-replicating underground while studying the biology for the needed specifications. Then one moment someone is walking out their front door in the real universe and maybe stumbles a bit before proceeding on, not realizing that they stumbled when some nanomachine stabbed a spike out of the ground into their brain and copied it, and every person and animal there while cheerfully disassembling the planet to make a giant computer. So you recover from your stumble a few thousand years later inside some secure processor running on a Matrioska brain in their home system, or maybe around our own sun, and the aliens who maintain that simulated Earth keep some backups, but you and every person and critter you know is safely tucked inside a simulated environment deep inside their territory, protected by the kinds of mega armadas and defenses some sprawling K2 Plus civilizations can muster. See the Matrioska Brain and Kardashev Scale episodes for details. Maybe when you die you wake up in their afterlife, or just get stored until the civilization you are from reaches a level where they are comfortable being purely digital and they pop in to say hi and offer you wider access to things. As far as they are concerned, they did you a favor, heck they don't even need to grey goo your planet, they could have taken mental snapshots of everyone and left us as is, and kept those running instead to preserve things. We might object that they killed us and stuck us in a simulation, but they might smirk back at the contradictions in that statement and regard the objection as being the same as someone complaining that taking a photograph of them stole their soul. That's what I meant earlier about the zoo hypothesis being both a very bad and very good solution to the Fermi Paradox, and also about how it didn't really matter, because it is essentially the simulation hypothesis at that point, and we've discussed that in terms of the Fermi Paradox before also. Whether the universe we are in is real or not doesn't make too much difference to the Fermi Paradox. First, All of our observations about the Universe that lead us to seeing a Fermi Paradox would not apply to the Universe simulating us, the true reality as it were, which might be some four-dimensional place, or have stars that actually orbit planets and trillions of them per galaxy for all we know, with space being a nice shade of blue instead of black. Second, if they are simulating the original Universe, or just simulating an entirely made-up Universe, It can be assumed they kept it decently self-consistent, so that it makes sense on inspection, meaning that the Fermi Paradox would have a logical answer internally consistent with the observable, if fake, universe. The simulators who designed the place can be expected not to leave blatant paradoxes and contradictions all over it if the goal is to keep us in the dark. Of course it might not be. But fundamentally, whether it's that case or the more classic non-interference approach, while you can make arguments both for and against the ethics of these approaches, there is something kind of smug and superior about that approach. That's an opinion, obviously. I won't deny there's good arguments for keeping quiet, but for my part I tend to think the best approach to non-interference in a culture is like the best approach to keeping people away from your civilization. In that case we said you would not hide, you would just do the equivalent of hanging no trespassing signs around your territory. 
for non-interference, I tend to think you'd be best off just introducing yourself, and telling them how to reach you if they want to talk. It seems more practical and ethical, and the alternatives don't really seem viable anyhow. Except of course for showing up and uploading the entire planet, which is undeniably pretty effective. Next week we will be looking at the other approach, of directly contacting primitive civilizations with little technology or even no technology at all, and tweaking their minds and physiology to be able to use technology, a concept called uplifting. That will be a two-part collaboration episode with John Michael Godier, with the first part on this channel and the second on his. The week after that we will be starting a discussion on artificial intelligence, with a look at androids, and we will try to sort out some common myths and misconceptions we often get on that topic. The week after that it will be back to the Outward Bound series to look at colonizing Titan, and we will explore the option for colonizing Saturn's largest moon along with looking at some of the concepts for robotic colonization of the solar system. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.